Après une lecture de Dante, quand le poète peint l'enfer et peint sa vie, sa vie, ombre qui fut des spectres poursuivis, forêt mystérieuse où ses pas effrayés s'égarent à tâtons au de chemin frayé. Noir voyage obstrué de rencontres difformes, spirale au bord douteux, aux profondeurs énormes, dont les cercles hideux vont toujours plus avant, dans une ombre où se meut l'enfer vague et vivant. Oui, c'est bien la, là la vie, au poète inspiré, et son chemin brumeux d'obstacles encombrés, mais pour que rien n'y manque en cette route étroite, vous nous montrez, toujours debout à votre droite, le génie aux frontes calmes, aux yeux pleins de rayons, le Virgile serein qui dit « Continuons ». So I think even if you don't know French, you'll hear the rhetoric of this poetry. Now, quickly, a translation. When the poet paints hell, he paints his own life. His life, a shadow in flight, pursued by specters a mysterious forest in which his halting steps falter in pathless thickets, 
dark journey obstructed by frightening encounters, descent down broken rims, down bottomless abysses, spiraling ever deeper into their frightening gloom, where vaguely hell seems to be alive and moving. This land is lost in impenetrable fog. On each step lingers a plaint, and in the black night, suppressed gnashing of white teeth frightens the senses. There are visions, hallucinations, chimeras, eyes that pain have transformed into bitter springs. Love, a couple in embrace, desperate and burning still, whirling by with gaping wounds. In a corner, crouch vengeance and hunger, sisters in godlessness snarling over a skeleton skull, their pale misery grinning at its own sight. Ambition, pride feeding on itself, licentious luxury, despicable greed, all the leaden weights that can encumber the soul. Further ahead, sloth, cowardice, treason, offering keys for sale and feeding on poison. And then, still further down, at the very bottom of the pit, the mask grimace of hate and suffering. Yes, it is true to life, inspired poet, true to life's shadowed path blocked by hurdles. However, to complete the picture of this narrow road, you show us, escorting you on your right, the poet of calm, mean, and luminous eye, Serene Virgil, who says, let us go on. So this is a poem that supposedly inspired Liszt to the sonata. Well, you heard from the tone of my voice that I have certain doubts about this. And in order to back them up somewhat, I want to very briefly rehearse the chronology of the work. It was sketched in 1837, so the year when Hugo wrote these, uh, the cycle. And in Liszt's uh, writings here in the second volume of um, his letter memoirs, if you will, in the translation of Lina Rahman, which he himself annotated later on, he says, in English translation, written in Bellagio on the Lake Como, he says, when the heat of the day is at its very worst, we often take shelter under the shadow of the plane trees of Villa Melzi and read the divine comedy at the feet of Comolli's statue, Dante, led by Beatrice. What a subject. And how sad that the sculptor has conceived it so badly that he made of Beatrice a fat, down-to-earth woman and of Dante a thin, cadaverous, one would almost say, pauvre honteux, a poor wretch, instead of the Signor dell'Altissimo Canto, the Lord of Song, words with which Dante himself characterized Homer. But to understand Dante, one would have to be a Michelangelo. However, should I confess it, in this incomparable, in this titanic work, there has always been something that touched me adversely, namely, that the poet did not conceive Beatrice as the ideal of beauty, but as the ideal of learning. I cannot reconcile myself to conceive this beautiful immaterial body uh, as the seat of deeply learned be an explanation of dogma, of condemnation of heresy, and of a discussion of eternal secrets. Woman does not rule man's heart by dissertations and syllogisms. It is not her task to prove God, but to allow him to be divine by the power of love and to elevate man towards heavenly regions. Woman's power does not express itself in the realm of knowledge, but in the realm of emotions. The loving woman is venerable. She is the true guardian angel of the male. But woman, as pedant, is a contradiction to herself, a dissonance that does not have a place anywhere in the hierarchy of sex. Now, let me <laughs> mention this, as you know, had the Countess de Boulle in Paris in 1833. She joined him in 1835 in Basel, and in, at the end of that year, the conservatory in Geneva was founded, and Liszt took over a piano class there. They lived in Geneva, 
and on December 18, 1835, Blondine, their first daughter, was born. In the spring of 1836 and December 1836, uh, Liszt played in uh, Paris, among other trifles, Beethoven's Opus 106. Uh, he left Paris on May the 1st, 1837, and went to the Chateau de Noron and stayed there, and, uh, and the Countess uh, joined him there uh, with uh, Georges Sand. They stayed there three months. Now, it is possible, of course, that uh, Victor Hugo's poem uh, reached him there, or that perhaps even Victor Hugo uh, also came to Noir, but we don't know about that. From uh, Noir, that is May, uh, June, July, in August or so, Liszt went to visit Lamartine at Saint Point, near, uh, um, you have a picture of Saint Point in there too. Then he went to, back to Geneva to Milan for a concert, and then they settled in Bellagio and uh, on Lake Como, where Cosima was born on the 25th of um, December. In between, Liszt had made a trip to Milan, where he played a uh, concert for two weeks before Cosima was born. Then again, in February 1838, they went to Milan, and on, May, uh, on March 1638, they went to uh, Venice for a concert, and from there, uh, Liszt went, went to Vienna to play for the victims of the flood in Budapest. Perhaps you also are familiar with the fact that originally he had announced two noon concerts, and the success was such that uh, his manager, Tobias Haslinger, announced ten, a series of ten concerts. But after six concerts, Liszt received the notice that the Countess was ill in Venice, and he went back to uh, Venice to see her again. So all I want to point out is this, that in the course of these concerts, early uh, in uh, 1839, Liszt already played an early version of his Dante Sonata. In Vienna, he already played what he then called, what he at that time called a fragment of Dante. The program of um, um, the concerts in Vienna is the usual, what would I say, hodgepodge of compositions. He played, among other things, uh, accompaniments. Uh, the singers uh, uh, contributed their services. Um, and uh, some uh, chamber music, among them the Archduke uh, Trio. And in a report of the Allgemeine Musik which I have here, which you might also want to look at. He list, uh, it is li uh, the Dante Sonata is listed as Dante ein Fragment. What I'm driving at is that I have a sneaking suspicion that the inspiration of the Dante Sonata was not the Victor Hugo poem, but the reading of Dante itself, une lec après une lecture de Dante, and that then, when the poem appeared, he picked up the title and called it a present lecture de Dante. Uh, there are some reasons, inner re reasons of inner criticism, why this seems to me uh, to be at least a defensible fantasy. Because if you recall the translation of the Hugo poem that I read, uh, you see that for, uh, Hugo confines himself exclusively to painting the inferno. There is absolutely nothing of any purgatory, or let alone paradiso atmosphere in the Hugo poem. He refers obliquely to the Francesca da Rimini episode and to um, Paolo, and he refers very decidedly and clearly to Virgil. And neither Francesca da Rimini nor Virgil in any sense seem to be present in the Apprecian Lecture de Dante. I believe, I can say with some conviction, that the content of this piece of music does not jibe with the content of the poem by Victor Hugo. Victor Hugo, as I tried to point out, concerns himself only with hell. Now, there is enough glory and paradise in this piece of music, I believe. So, this remains to be studied, whether 
they did get to know the Victor Hugo poem really at the time when he was in Bellagio with the Countess or whether he wrote the piece first and then used the title, which is my theory. And I do believe that Paula Rayburg is wrong in saying that the entire composition is based on one flickering, flaming motive.